Welcome everybody. We'll get going in just a minute or two. We'll individual sign on. So please stay right with us. All right, let's go ahead and get going. We, we have a, a absolute phenomenal presentation with uh, extremely interesting uh, right off the, uh, the shelf data um, that we're gonna go over tonight with our, uh, our very, very prominent speaker that is well known to all of us. I'll do a formal introduction to Dr. Undar in just a second. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce our co-moderator tonight. That's uh, Alex Hank. Alex Hank is a pediatric perfusionist working at um, the uh, Augusta Children's Hospital for Jim St. Louis, and she will be our co-moderator. Along with myself, my name is Al Stammers, and I'm the Vice President of Quality and Research at Specialty Care. So to begin, um, just a few housekeeping details. Uh, I think everybody knows if you participated with these webinars before, uh, we are offering 1.2 uh, ABCB Category 1 CEUs. And it's very easy to obtain these. We just ask that you stay logged in for 45 minutes or more. That's a, a no-brainer with tonight's presentation. And then uh, complete the post survey and submit it. Um, within about a week, the CEU certificate will be emailed. Um, and that's coming directly from our uh, meeting coordinator, who's Maggie Ring, who's in the back. Row. And then, of course, the recorded session, as, as usual, will be posted on YouTube, usually within that week's time. Uh, the post, uh, serve, post presentation survey is very straightforward. It's only three questions, and we ask that you, um, you complete that. And then as we've done in the past, and we will continue to do tonight, we will have a question answer um, session. If you look at the, the um, ribbon that is at either the top or the bottom of your screen, uh, there are two ways that you could ask questions. We have a chat function, uh, which uh, Alex and I will be looking at throughout the webinar and also the Q&A. The Q&A is probably the best way to do that because that has the option to go ahead and, um, and um, uh, identify a question that you really believe is important. And if you click and like on that, it'll bump it up in the queue towards the, uh, towards the top. So, uh, so with that, it is indeed my honor and privilege to uh, welcome Dr. Akif Unda. Um, he is, uh, as I mentioned, well known to, to all of us. Uh, just a little bit of background. If, if I went through his entire 100 page um, CV, it would take up the entire webinar. So I'm just going to briefly highlight some of the more important aspects of his, um, his career. He's a tenured professor of pediatrics, surgery, and biomedical engineering. Uh, he is the founder and director of the Penn State Pediatric Cardiovascular Research Center at the Penn State um, Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. And he's founded multiple organizations involved with mechanical assist and artificial organs. He's also the founder and president of the International Society for Pediatric Mechanical Cardiopulmonary Support. He received several master's degrees from um, Texas University and one at the University of Texas in biomedical engineering, uh, plus his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and where his uh, thesis was design and performance of physiologic pulsatile flow. As I mentioned, he's founded multiple um, programs and uh, sessions over the years. Um, most recently, the 16th International Conference of Pediatric Mechanical Circulatory Support uh, and Pediatric Cardiopulmonary Perfusion, which was held, or excuse me, will be held in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and he's published over 300 publications, 400 abstracts, 11 book chapters, and just a, a remarkable, remarkable CV. So with that, it is my pleasure to shift the screen now uh, to Dr. Undar, and uh, who's going to present a randomized clinical trial of perfusion modalities on cerebral hemodynamics, pediatric logistic and organ dysfunction score, and clinical outcomes in congenital heart surgery patients. Dr. Undar. Thank you so much, Al. Can everyone say, can see my screen is okay? Yes. 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 Perfect. 
And um, this is a randomized clinical trial that the I'm going to present the results. But the, first of all, I will really would like to give more details to perfusion community, how we uh, optimize the cardiopulmonary bypass circuitry and how we do pilot clinical trials and then randomized cl clinical tri tri trials. I have no disclosures and but uh, i will not uh, i mean i will mention only a few for pro product names and again that yeah, i have no financial interest whatsoever with those uh, pro products that uh, in my presentation um uh, I mean, the ABCs of any kind of research, not just the cardiopulmonary bypass, but the literature review is the uh, first step we have to do, I mean, no matter what. But the second step is in vitro experiments. You know, in particular, it's so important for positive flow research because I, uh, when I say this, people do not believe me, but the FDA has not approved a single oxygenator with positive flow conditions. All these FDA approvals for cardiopulmonary bypass component, components are based on laminar or non positive flow. So this is so important. If you want to really use positive flow, you have to do uh, translational research. You have to do in vitro evaluations. And then if in vitro evaluations are OK, then you can go to the next step in vivo or the animal experiments, at least a few animal experiments, when the entire team feels comfortable about positive flow, then you may go to the, uh, you know, that you, you may perform pilot clinical trial, trial. After pilot clinical trial and for positive flow research, two parameters are so important. One is plasma-free hemoglobin levels, and before and after cardiopulmonary bypass, and second, during cardiopulmonary bypass, the uh, um, circuit pressure, circuit pressures to monitor is extremely important. Then if you feel okay, if your res results of the pilot clinical trial is okay, then it's okay to go to randomized clinical trial. Just the basics of positive versus non positive flow, the, even though this is the longest controversy on cardiopulmonary bypass, there is no question. This is the longest controversy, pos versus no pos. In my opinion, the biggest controversy on this issue because the lack of the precise quantification of pressure flow waveforms. People are talking about pulse versus no pulse, and in most of the articles, you may not even see a single pressure flow of waveforms. We really do not know what they are talking about. And we adopted the Shepard's energy equivalent pressure formula because it has flow and pressure all together. That is the reason. And the most important thing about the EEP is also the units of EEP is mean arterial pressure. That means we can directly compare EEP with the mean arterial pressure and mean arterial pressure everyone do have. So the difference between mean arterial pressure and EEP is the extra energy only generated under positive flow conditions. And we call it that that is our con contribution to the Popastal virus research surplus hemodynamic energy or she. She is the one that, the, but even you may have diminished postal flow, you can still see EEP is uh, gre greater than mean arterial pressure. Under postal flow conditions, EEP, no way will be below mean arterial pressure. It's unfortunate there are so many publications they are showing that the actually EEP is lower than mean arterial pressure. Those are not accurate. So that's the main con main reason for the controversy is the lack of precise quantification. For a cardiopulmonary bypass circuitry, the roller pump, of course, is the most important component of the, of the circuit because we are talking about pulse versus no pulse, but also the oxygenator an arterial filter and the arterial cannula are actually important because each component absorbs some degree of positivity then patient may see only a fraction of positivity generated under positive uh, flow conditions or non positive flow conditions. People do believe that the non positive roller, roller pumps do not produce any non positivity. That's not true. 
only centrifugal pumps produce non-positile flow. Roller pumps under non-positile perfusion, you can still see some degree of positivity. And uh, what we do that the in vitro experiments, the, this is again that the, we have done hundreds of in vitro experiments, but the good thing about our team, we actually uh, use identical clinical components of our bypass circuitry. For our, you know, whatever our cl clinicians use, we do use the same thing in the laboratory and evaluate those com comp components. And, uh, and uh, for, 90% of the time we use human blood prime the circuitry. So our viscosity and elasticity of blood is very similar to cardiopulmonary bypass conditions. And flow rates, we change the, depending on the experimental setup from uh, 200 to 500 ml, 100 ml increments for this one. Pseudo-patient pressure with the Hoffman clamp, we can actually uh, uh, make it in the certain level and the Positive flow settings, I will explain in a few minutes why we selected these particular settings. But then we actually look at the pressure drops of the each component. And I bet on everything, most of the people may, may not even realize pressure drop of the cannula under positive versus non positive has the highest percentage. Higher pressure drop is the cannula than tubing. It's about, we are talking about quarter inch, five feet length of arterial tubing, and the pressure drop of the oxygenator is the lowest in this particular setting. And again, we optimize the circuitry, we evaluated every single FDA approved component, every single FDA approved oxygenator and arterial cannula, and we came up with this circuitry, with uh, Capiox uh, oxygenator and the Metronic, the DIP cannula are the best, uh, and the for neonatal settings. And one thing for perfusionists actually would like to see, just look at the com compare non positive versus positive. And these are again eight experiments at each experimental stage. And you will see that the, there are absolutely no differences between pulse versus no pulse at normal thermia, 35 or high hypothermia, 28 the degrees of Celsius. So the, this is one of the real reasons why we have to do uh, translational research before we you know, the, uh, use these pro products in our patients. And I can assure you there are other oxygenators, I will not give the names, but if, if I use a different oxygenator here, then you will see this pro pressure drop goes up to about 70 or 80 millimeter mercury at the identical experimental conditions. So that's why it's so important to select, uh, uh, to optimize the circuitry. Once again, you have the positile pump, you generate 100% positile or non-positile energy, but energy loss with this circuits goes up to 75 to 78%. So patient can only see 22% of the energy generated by the pump. That's so important. You know why we have to quantify them in terms of hemodynamic energy levels and surplus hemodynamic energy levels again that the or we, we call it she that the under non positive flow again you may see significantly lower than positive this is the same identical experimental set setup then you can see this extra energy actually in our hypothesis maintains the better microcirculation that's why it improves the vital organ injury or vital organ re recovery and again during normal thermic as well as hypothermic conditions after we have done, of course, that the dozens of other additional experiments uh, in vitro, then we have done over 300 picket experiments. And most of those experiments we have done before I joined the Penn State Fair faculty, actually, most of them we have done at Duke University at Ross Angerleiter's research labs and uh, with uh, Dr. John Calhoun from UT Health Science Center. And uh, some of the piglet experiments I will share with, with you. The, these are actually were done at Texas Children's Hospital when I was at Baylor College of Medicine 20 years ago. 
And this is the deep hypothalamic circuitry RSMO model about 25 years ago. It's mostly used for neonatal cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, with the uh, pre-deep uh, hypothalamic circuitry RS with the cerebral perfusion pressure, 55 millimeter mercury. Then after one hour of circuitry RS, 10 minutes of cold reperfusion and 40 minutes of rewarming. And we are uh, again at the cerebral perfusion pressure to 55. Then we adjust this one to 40 and the 70. And we are using radioactive microspheres. We are in injecting different uh, isotopes at each experimental stage. And that's how we measure the global blood flow. And in addition to this is under non positive flow conditions without changing anything. When we just switch the posital mode with the University of Texas non posital pump, which is our my PhD this, uh, dissertation at that time, that is the significant the differences. This is like black versus white. This is so different compared to non posital perfusion. People time to time do ask me why. I am just so you know to thrilled about positive flow while the, the data is here. And every region of brain, not just the cerebral blood flow, the global flow, but the cerebellum, basal gang, the autonomous, left and the right hemispheres, identical pattern. You see significant improvement of uh under non-positile versus non-positile flow. And it is positive versus non-positive flow. Cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen is again that the significantly better under positive flow conditions and the cerebral oxygen that delivery again, we can easily calculate these uh, values once we have the blood flow flows, non-positive versus positive, significantly difference. And the cerebral vascular res resistance under non-positive flow, of, of course, significantly higher because the uh, flow rates are significantly uh, better in uh, positive flow, but the vascular rare resistance is higher. The only disadvantage of these experiments, this is a not, I mean, non-FTA approved uh, physiologic quality positive pump, okay? But then when we move to Texas Children's Hospital, we repeat the same experiments using, again, that the deep hypothalamic circuitry RS model, but using the FDA-approved Stuckert S3 hardline machine. And we, again, that you look at the global blood flow, much, much better. We couldn't adjust the cerebral perfusion pressure for these particular settings, but you can clearly see, I mean, uh, there is a trend under positive flow conditions, renal blood flow, and again, right and the left kidneys, and if we measure these, and after cardiopulmonary bypass in these piglet models, and again, that these are piglets and three kilo in body weight. And then you can clearly see after cardiopulmonary bypass, we have significant improvement uh, for uh, kidney, right and the left uh, kidney blood flows. But the most important parameter for me, I think myocardial blood flow, even though in kidney blood flow, I'll go back, compared to baseline, as you can see, this is about one third of the blood flow. But for myocardial blood flow in these piglet experiments, I mean, it can come actually very similar to baseline flow. And this is again, deep hypothermic circuitry RS model in a piglet, in piglets. And we are talking about for each experimental settings about eight to 10 piglets. And the, we published these in anazotoxic surgery, but then we evaluated every single FDA approved hardline machine. This is the physiologic positive pump not approved by the FDA. This is the hemodynamic energy levels. And these are all five pumps are approved by the FDA. As you can see, I'm sorry, the JOSRA uh, HL220 uh, has the highest uh, uh, hemodynamic energy levels compared to S3. And this is mass mounted uh, positive flow. But as you can clearly see, even though these are under positive flow conditions, you cannot generate any positivity with these pumps. So based on these experiments, then we, we use HL220 for our uh, uh, clinical experiments and the hospital settings 
frequency, you, you can change to 40 to 150 and the the base flow, which is non positive flow and start time and this is stop time. This is actually for RR interval. You can change these values, but these are extremely important once again. I can make this positive frequencies in a way that you will not believe, you may not see any possibility in the patient. So it is so important to test these parameters, whatever we say, do not believe us. Please do not believe us. Just do in vitro experiment and to see with your certain settings, with your components of the circuits, you know, that if you can achieve similar uh, res results or not, because we have already published everything for base flow for this particular hard dang machine. We use 10% start time, 20 stop time, 80, and based on the patient's body weight, we change if it's gr gr greater than 15 kilo in body weight, uh, frequency is going to be 90 bits between 7 to 15 kilo, uh, uh, 15. Uh, Seven to uh, 15 kilo, it's about 100, and this uh, smaller than 6.9 kilo, it's 120 bits per minute. So, positive flow, that's how it generates part of uh, pump heads to starts and to stops. That is how it generates positive flow using again our experimental settings at Penn State. But can we see this positivity in the patient? This is transcranial Doppler. And this is positivity index under non positive flow. Without, we are not changing anything else. We are just pressing the positive from bottom for three seconds. That's how we can see the changes in this middle cerebral artery of the patient. Okay, so these are just not mimics. This is as soon as we go back to again non positive flow, that's what you see. Okay, so this is. Uh, so important to see, actually, we were not expecting to see this kind of change and with roller pump. I was expecting to see this kind of change using a, using a physiology positive pump that we have done uh, experimental experiments, okay? And then we actually uh, done pilot clinical trial and use this transcranial Doppler in 26 uh, pediatric patients and cross clamp time, pump time, weight and everything were very similar. And again, that the, what we were after actually for plasma-free hemoglobin levels. You know that the under non positive flow was actually a little higher compared to non positive flow. This is our first pilot experiment we have done and we published the results in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery and mean arterial pressure were actually maintained much better. It was the only statistical significant difference we found out in our pilot experimental trial. So under uh, tubing, arterial tubing of these pumps that the, you can clearly see under non positive flow, we can still show significant positivity compared to non positive compared to positive flow. Once again, these black bars, these are, we obtain them under non positive flow. So since we optimize the circuitry so good, in my opinion, that's why we are seeing this significant quality of positivity under non positive conditions. And positivity index in the right middle cerebral artery in the patient, and that's how uh, uh, how we actually see significantly better compared to ba ba baseline in the posital group compared to non posital group. And since 2004 and 2005, we are using multi-modality neuromonitoring at Penn State Children's Hospital. The reason is because of this uh, transcranial Doppler is extremely safe because we not just quantify the positivity in terms of positivity index, but also we measure the uh, number of microemboli in this middle cerebral artery. And we also, we used to use this uh, it, it activates until uh, you know that the company do, do not uh, 
sell anymore that the uh, transducers or the connectors, so we cannot have them, but we did use, and the, we actually have so many interesting res results using this EDAC device. Then, of course, that we use NEARS, NEARS everyone do use, and also we use 16 uh, lead EEG as well for every single cardiopulmonary bypass patient. This is the uh, EDAC uh, res results that we have published over uh, 12 years years ago, Dr. Clark, one of our congenital heart surgeons that he did uh, publish this in the uh, World Journal of Pediatric and Cardiovascular Surgery. And surprisingly, I mean, we were expecting to seeing the insult during cross clamp off and on. I mean, that was everybody do know this, but nobody knew biggest insult at the initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass. And I can assure you, this is not coming from perfusion. This is actually coming from not de-airing the venous cannula properly. So how the arterial, field, arterial cannula de-aired, in my opinion, in every single case, venous cannula must be de-aired the same uh, way because whatever you see here, it's going to come back to arterial line. It's about 10% of this uh, emboli coming to arterial line. So de airing the venous cannula is extremely important as well. And again, that if we can use the same uh, transcranial Doppler device, we can monitor the middle cerebral, uh, uh, we can mo monitor the hits or the gas microemboli at the middle cerebral artery, as well as in the circuitry using this custom made, custom made, um, uh, custom made uh, housing unit for the second uh, transcranial uh, Doppler prop. And as you can clearly see, there is absolutely, uh, it's actually lower in a uh, positive group compared to non positive group. In this circuitry, it's very similar number of microemboli. Then actually, we look at the uh, certain biomarkers, you know, at the PI1 TPA is one of them. You know, again, another pilot clinical trial for the uh, patients, 20 in each group under positive flow. Pi one TPA ratio is a lot more physiologic, but to compare this 24 hour after cardiopulmonary bypass in non postal group, you can see a significant decrease, and this may contribute actually the white matter injury. You know that that's why it's so important. Now actually we are running so many other clinical cell samples with other biomarkers that we use. We also look at the, in the same way upper E levels, and again that the after 24 hour of cardiopulmonary bypass, we can again that the, uh, show significant the differences in uh, uh, upper E le levels as well. So after we complete all these, you know, uh, homework. Yeah, shall I call them, you know, that the, then we have actually done a uh, clinical trial, randomized cl clinical trial, again, lo lo looking at the pulse versus no pulse. And the, our hypothesis was, you know, uh, patient utilizing pulse perfusion will de demonstrate be better outcomes. And the um, PILA2 score is one of the score that you widely use for pediatric intensivists, but I do not know why in the world congenital heart surgeons rarely use it. And if we do not actually have only a couple patients, a couple papers in the lit literature about this. And this paper was actually the first one from our group that is showing that this plateau scores is extremely important because you are looking at the five different organ systems like neurology, cardiovascular, renal, respiratory, and hematologic. And we can actually use these 10 variables using the online calculator. We can uh, calculate the plateau scores. And in addition to plateau scores, we did uh, lo look at the pediatric risk of mortality or PRISM2 scores. That, that is also, also that the assesses the risk of mortality in children admitted to P, uh, PQ at, you know, that the, at the first uh, 12 hours and the uh, PRISM3 scores, 17 different uh, physiologic variables were included. And then 
VASA active, anthropic search scores, uh, uh, score, V score, and other online cat calculator we use for this randomized clinical trial. And in this particular trial, we had 159 patients and the either on positive 83 and the non positive 76 patients. And the, we use uh, transcranial Doppler and NIRS uh, for uh, transcranial, uh, for uh, cerebral hemodynamics. And the multiple, uh, uh, multiple organ injury was quantified using plot two scores at 24, 48, and 72 hours. And the PRISM3 score, first 12 hours uh, after surgery and this score is 24 and 48 after 48 hour after the surgery and we look at the short term clinical outcomes uh, uh, for this patient cohort and in pulse versus no pulse patient cohorts are very similar in terms of uh, patient ca characteristics you know age uh, sex weight height very very similar and the mortality ca category it's unfortunate most of our patients are actually risk category one to three only we had a handful of patients risk category four and five and again that for cardiopulmonary bypass time and the cross clamp time cardiopulmonary bypass characteristics were very similar between two groups and again that the one again arterial line pressure were very similar pulse versus no pulse and again emboli counts from 160 on posital group versus 162 non posital in in the arterial line is again that they were very similar not statistically significant and plasma free hemoglobin in that level was very again that they were very similar between the groups, two groups. And again, that the when we look at the positivity index using transcranial Doppler in the arterial line, we were much better. But again, if we use centrifugal pumps, then you will see this line zero. Not you will not see this 0.6. This is because baseline is about 1.2, 1.3. So then you will see significant line, but because we are using this roller pump, which is actually a good thing, I really would not even try, I would not even suggest using non posital uh, I mean, uh, centrifugal pump for a clinical trial, but I strongly suggest using centrifugal pump in animal experiments and to do animal experiments first, then switch to, um, you know, uh, uh, clinical trial. And again, that the positivity index in the right middle cerebral artery were uh, significantly better under positive flow conditions. And the, this is positivity index recovery compared to uh, baseline values uh, before incision and positive flow maintain better uh, re recovery compared to non posital flow, as you can clearly see. And again, this is in the right middle cerebral artery. That's why it's so important to use transcranial Doppler uh, for this patient population. And regional cerebral oxygen saturation, yes, the re re results are different compared to baseline, pulse versus no pulse, uh, but there are absolutely no the differences between perfusion modalities. The only differences we are seeing here because mean arterial pressure of these patients decreased significantly and the regional cerebral oxygenation has a direct correlation with the mean arterial pressures. And some people do confuse it with um, gases, microemboli count. I mean, regional cerebral oxygen saturation has nothing to do with gases microemboli. That's why we have to use transcranial Doppler to measure uh, precisely uh, uh, gases microemboli at the middle cerebral artery. And the PILAT2 scores, when we look at them, that the, we can clearly see and 24 hours between perfusion mode modalities, even though a significant recovery, but there were no differences between the perfusion modalities. Intubation time, 15 hours in the postal group, 25 hours at the four non postal group, ICU length of stay, very similar, hospital length of stay, very similar, and more mortality, only one patient died in postal group versus zero on non postal group. And this is the subgroup analysis based on the risk ca category. Uh, for stat five categories, and again that the uh, um, 
we use this uh, and the uh, as as we expected for uh, 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 intubation time, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, and the uh, PRISM3 scores were higher in category for patients compared to uh, lower uh, risk uh, category per patients. And again, that the uh, once once again, the reason is because these patients were subjected to hot, longer duration of cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, cross clamp time. And we also sub analysis of these patients under neonates only, 74 neo neonates, 40 of them are hospital group and the 34 of them non hospital group. And we can clearly show that the uh, uh, the uh, injury in, in terms of PLA2 scores were significantly higher, even in POS versus no POS, but the recovery were delay in neonatal patients. And when we look at this subgroup, and again, that the um, um, intubation time, 22, three hours versus 47 hours, again, that the ICU length of stay, very similar hospital length of stay, and very similar between the groups. So uh, uh, conclusions that the, although the quality of positivity as measured by the positive index was better maintained in the positive group compared to non positive group, this, this they did not translate to any significant improvements in either plateau scores or short-term or long-term outcomes and mortality. And, but please, I just wanna make sure that the people do follow me because we have not really compared pulse versus no pulse in this clinical trial, we really compare two different forms of positive perfusion. And under non positive flow, we actually achieve real good quality of positivity. And contrary to our initial hypothesis, positive perfusion did not impact plateau scores or clinical outcomes, even in risk uh, 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 certify good groups. And, uh, but at the same time, in this clinical trial, I believe that it, this is one of the, in particular, pediatric tri trials is one of the rare ones, maybe the fir first one, showing that the plasma-free hemoglobin levels were not the different pulse versus no pulse. And more importantly, microemboli levels at the middle cerebral artery, as well as in the circuitry, were very similar pulse versus no pulse. But I mean, I really want to say positive flow is not a magic bullet because some of the centers in particular in overseas, their outcomes are so bad, they may think that the, you know, using papastal flow will really decrease their mortality and everything. Well, this is just a myth. This is not the truth. You really need to look at other uh, components for, you know, that the, for uh, min minimizing vital organ injury and more mortality in, in this cohort of patients. And this is again, only 159 patients and we have to do more work. And actually we have done uh, more. We have one more paper just accepted and the, we will present it in the AATS meeting in LA in um, May of 2000, uh, May of the, this year. And the, in that cohort, we have 284 patients. And we actually, in that cohort, we have more high risk patients and the results are a little the different, but once again, I really would like to, particularly for perfusionists, I know that the most of you do know this, but really the evidence-based research is mandatory. This is not an option if you really want to use positive flow in pediatric patients. And once again, the entire CPP circuit, not just the pump, should be optimized for pulse versus no pulse. All details about our clinical trial and everything else is actually, we just published in this paper in Annals of Thoracic Surgery only a couple months ago. You can find them. If you cannot find it, just send me an email. I'll be more than happy to share every single detail about this randomized clinical trial. And I will be happy to participate any other additional clinical tri tri trials elsewhere. And, um, Acknowledgements that the, I really that the, the reason that the, I am here to today I'm to, talking to you and I do believe that the, with three congenital heart surgeons one of them is John Calhoun who really that to push me in this field he was my PhD advisor 
and the, the Dr. Rosanger Leider, he not just uh, you know that he, I mean encouraged me, but also that he, he did I mean fund entire all these uh experiments you know at using radioactive microspheres i learned a lot at dr Langer Leider's lab laboratory as well as at chuck fraser at at that time at he was at the baylor college of medicine he really that he helped my career at uh significantly and uh al did mention earlier that the about the uh new co-conference actually we have a we already done the 16 international conference. I'm sorry, this will be the 17 international conference and we, we will have in May uh, 11th and 12th at Morgan Stanley's Child Children's Hospital and the Dr. Sabrina Law is the one actually uh, lo lo local chair for uh, this event. And uh, in this particular co conference, actually, we, we may have uh, more uh, um, more hands on tra tra training as well for uh, cardiopulmonary by bypass sur circuits with the help of uh, perfusionists at the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. And again, that the L, thank you so much for your kind introduction and the, thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation. Wonderful. Uh, Akif, that was uh, uh, magnificent. I really do appreciate you going through so much information in such a short time. And, and I congratulate you on the, the publication um, in the annals uh, of this, this remarkable randomized clinical trial with so many um, tests that, uh, you know, were, were you know, you, you hard to, it's hard to imagine a conclusion uh, that you came up with not based upon the, the significant amount of testing that you've done, you and the team have done. So, so congratulations. Um, okay, let's go ahead and open this up now for, um, for a Q&A. And, &A. and, um, and uh, excuse me, uh, you should be seeing the Q&A set. There we go. That should be up on the screen right now. Um, and uh, Alex, is it okay with you if I begin with the first question? And uh, I, I've got a few procedural uh, logistical questions um, that I just wanted to, to ask you, Keith, uh, very quickly. Um, you, you talked about all your initial studies or the majority of them were done with human blood outside of the, the, uh, the uh, piglet lab. Um, did you use fresh blood during that or was it something that somebody could uh, state that, you know, using aged blood, you know, we, when we use human blood, it's all outdated blood for our studies. Um, were you able to get fresh human blood, which probably has a much better um, biological or radiological function than uh, than outdated blood? Um, uh, excellent question, Al. If uh, we use hemolysis tests, of course, at TV, we use uh, fresh blood, and the, at uh, Penn State Hershey, we have the luxury. Our blood bank, actually, our donors do go to blood bank, donate the blood, and they do actually come up the stairs. We actually use very fresh blood, only half an hour, you know, that fresh, that's that fresh. So if for our hemolysis test, for our most of the experiments, we are using the blood, uh, the, it's about to expire. So we have the uh, technicians in the blood bank, they really, uh, like us, I would say, <laughs> and the, you know, the, they give us a call that the, they, they say, well, we have the bloods, you know, the four units, five units of blood is about to expire in two days. Would you like to have them? Now, of course, we always say yes. So we actually set up all our experiments based on uh, the blood that we get from blood bank in our labs. So, but we do use, uh, uh, it, it depends on the experiment, but uh, we do use also that the fresh as well as non-fresh blood. Thank you. Alex, do you want to, um, we've got quite a few questions that are in our Q and A um, area. So uh, Alex, would you mind uh, addressing um, one or more of those? Akif, we have a question from Maureen Gray. She asked, where were the arterial cannula placed in the piglet study? Um, and what type of cannula was it? Have you used different types in an attempt to decrease pressure drop across the cannula? Excellent question. And the, I mean, the way that if you put the cannula, we have our surgeons in the animal lab at Penn State. 
So they actually do open the chest. They place the cannula the way that they place in per patients. We uh, evaluated, of course, all neonatal cannulas as well as uh, adult cannulas for cardiopulmonary bypass as well as ECMO. We love to, I mean, again, that the, I have no disclosures, we have no financial interest, but I have to say this, DLP cannulas are the best for uh, neo neonatal pa patients because they have significantly less, less per pressure drop. And actually we did publish the res results, several uh, articles and the, but mostly recent one, 2022, we did actually uh, publish these uh, cannula pressure drops uh, with Krishna Patel and myself and the World Journal of Pediatric and uh, Congenital Heart Surgery Journal we already have. And also that the, we just published another book chapter. And I'll be happy to share, uh, Alex, with, with you, then you share with, with the team. We have all these you know, parameters in addition to not just the pressure drop, but also we, uh, we, um, um, we actually classify the cannula by M numbers. We also that the calculate the M numbers and to see that the how they are actually better or not. So that there, there, there are so many data we'll be happy to you know that to share. Thank you very much, Akit. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Alex. I was gonna piggyback off, but um Jorge Luis uh, Molina. Uh, made a comment that 7,500 DLP series aortic cannulas in pediatrics have the lowest pressure drop. So I was going to piggyback off that since we were talking about cannulas. But if I say one thing about the cannulas, the reason that we have to repeat all these experiments, because cannula manufacturers do not test and all cannula manufacturers, you know, at the pressure flow curves, in my opinion, are invalid because all of them are done using lactated ringers with normothermia. So what we do here, we actually use human blood and we are using normothermic as well as hypothermic conditions to actually give real pressure drops as well as the M numbers. That's why, but the, I agree the DLP so, so far is the best cannula for cardiopulmonary bypass, for ECMO, again, that the DLP as well as Mama K are very similar. Great. And uh, uh, Keith, I don't know, Jorge Molina is a very prominent pediatric uh, perfusionist who's uh, done a lot of bench type research on this. So uh, thank you, Jorge, for your, for your comment and your expertise. Um, I'd like to stay in the same realm of circuitry. Uh, and I love the fact that, you know, your, your presentation really summarized, you know, that your non-pulsatile flow and pulsatile flow in a roller pump you know, they're one of the same, even though the pulsatile indexes and the EEPs are going to be different. That was very, very moving. But the question that uh, this individual, I'm sorry, it's anonymous, is posing, does the pulsatile index um, change based upon the tubing in the raceway? Uh, for years, we used to use silicone uh, tubing. I'm, I'm not sure quite how frequent that is done anymore um, before switching to PVC. Uh, but what are your thoughts on the tubing um, in the raceway in regards to one eliciting a better PI than the other? It's an excellent question. Again, that, that uh, tubing that they may also absorb some of the pulsatile energy. And again, that it depends on where do you really that you put the transducer or the con connector. You know, at the, then you can actually easily see, you know, in circuitry, how much energy loss, but the for, I mean, we do not use that race for tubing as well. I mean, we, we used to use for our, actually for long-term that the, for our ECMO patients, as you know, that the, for when we use the roller pump. But if I open a parenthesis here, this is also so important. Roller pumps, you know, that the Al, uh, we just did discuss this maybe, yeah, yesterday we, with you, but I really, that the, we do have this very important data, in my opinion, I really would like to share it. This is the, we analyzed the ASO registry da database from 2016 to 2020. And VV ECMO, neonatal patients only. These are uh, all PMP membrane oxygenators and 612 neonates. 
what we have seen in this the database analysis, again, it is not our data. We have seen the use of roller pump has a greater odds of uh, survival by 3.8% compared to centrifugal pumps. And I mean, there are large medical centers right, right now, like Boston Children's and uh, CHOP and Children's Hospital in Atlanta. They are going back to roller pumps. And you know that the, that's, I mean, this is, you know, unrelated to pulse versus no pulse, but even for ECMO, now people, I mean, the large medical centers are using roller pumps for, they are switching back to ECMO pumps after they, I mean, personally, I do not believe that these centrifugal pumps should not be used for pediatric cardiopulmonary by bypass at all. I mean, it's really the one extra component to fail. There is absolutely no reason to take that risk, you know, and, you know, there are some centers, they try to create postal flow with centrifugal pump. Trust me, the, again, that if we try that and the pump head gets too hot and the severe hemolysis that they may see. Wow, great statement, that's, that's remarkable. And there are a number of questions um, individuals want to know, um, you know, really, uh, you had the one slide that showed the difference. So I think it was the Yostra pump had the, the best pulsatility, um, and then they really tailed off. With modern day heart lung machines, here are two questions that I'm going to combine, and I thank both people for these. Um, they, uh, it, it, it is the evolution of heart lung machines, even like the spectrum, uh, which probably hasn't gone through a full analysis because it's relatively new compared to the Stockerts and the others. Um, is it due to the changes and the increased technology in Heartland Machine that were perhaps better to create a pulsatile index that is, is more effective than our predecessor devices such as the S3 and others, which a lot of this research, even going back to the, what was it, the Sarens uh, pumps many years ago, probably I keep when you first started, you're probably using Sarens pulsatile uh, flow uh, devices. So, so anyway, my question is, and the question from the field, you know, is there a difference in the heart and lung machines and is the newer technology uh, what resulted in that? It is a wonderful co-question and I do understand the co-concerns, but I'm telling you that the newer heart lung machines may not even have an option for pulsatile flow. Okay, so pastel flow is, I mean, I just got an email this afternoon, one of the friends, Rick C. Smith, from uh, uh, the Lancaster General Hospital, he, Rick, Rick, Rick was saying that, that they are using Papacetal flow past 35 years. But in my opinion, the use of Papacetal flow decreased significantly. Even at Penn State now, we changed the hard lung machine. We do not use Papacetal flow any longer. So we have a different hard lung machine and we have not evaluated that particular hard lung machine even with non pulsatile flow. But because of those are modular pumps, and again, it is just my speculation, and this is actually one of the projects we just assigned a medical intern. Uh, she's going to actually uh, look at the positivity index of this particular modular pumps versus the, our earlier pumps. Actually, we just switched to positile pumps maybe about a year ago. So we have only limited the data, but most likely by this summer, we may have more the data to compare this new generation modular pumps versus the older generation of the pumps. Interesting. Alex? All right, I'm working on putting a few of these questions together. Um, we had a follow up from Maureen Gray, uh, Akif. She said, as in ECMO cases, a distal perfuser is sometimes used to decrease the pressure drops. Perhaps a line off the aortic cannula to another peripheral site would decrease the pressure drop at the tip, preserving pulsatility a bit more. Yes or no? Do you agree? I don't have experience. I cannot say yes or no. I'm sorry. Because I don't have the, the data. If I have the data, then, you know, the, that's for, but the, I wouldn't change anything in clinical practice just to generate the better positive flow. 
Let me follow up. Much. Alex, is that okay if I ask um, uh, Dr. Undar a question on, on his uh, use of neuromonitoring? And that seems to be a really developing field. The TCD, the EDEC, and others, you know, those are great. And you really have promoted the use of uh, transcranial Doppler as being beneficial. The question that I have is you're doing EEG monitoring. Um, it was part of the indices that you use. Um, had you considered somatosensory evoked potential? Uh, which we also know is used in, in operating rooms and theaters, uh, you know, specifically for individuals going aortic procedures. Uh, do you have experience or comments on that particular modality in the pediatric population? Um, EEG data, even though we do collect, we haven't done much about it. So really I cannot say about it, but one thing that I should say, I should mention, even though we promote to use uh, uh, multi-modality neuromonitoring and transcranial Doppler, current DV devices should be really, you know, change. You know, I mean, there are actually some changes we are using, I believe one of the earlier models of the uh, transcranial Doppler and the, and the one of the limitations we cannot really the differentiate be between particulate emboli and the gases, my microemboli. We just see it emboli as an emboli. And if that emboli is greater than 40 micron in the diameter, then we can actually see a hit. So in actually, you know that the, but the vast majority of these emboli, as you know, that the smaller than 40 micron in the diameter. So we need to have better transcranial Doppler devices, better, uh, uh, you know, that the, in order to, and also we have better stabilizers for in particular neonatal patients for this, but the, for, I mean, other than that, I'm not sure what else I can add. Thank you. Alex, I'll go ahead and ask a question just yes, because we're getting low on time and you go ahead and interrupt me at any time. Um, you're very short, briefly, Akif, uh, adult versus pediatric. Uh, is, is any of this information, uh, can we uh, you know, place in the adult mode? There's actually a question on this. Uh, I think it was Francis Delgado um, had mentioned this. So you know, is, is there something that we can make from all the research you've done in the pediatric population or should we stay away from it? Uh, uh, they must do the, uh, you know, the translational research, but more importantly, I mean, the, of course, the rate fre fre frequency is not going to be the same for ad adults. It's going to be, I wouldn't go more than 75 bits or the max 70 bits per minute, but the, for other hospital flow settings should be very similar you know, and the, of, of course, S3 or now S, S5 may, may have a, the different settings, but again, you just wanna do a couple uh, in vitro tests, then a couple animal experiments, but they again must, uh, you know, that the uh, do a translational research and the select the oxygenators as well as the cannula. That's so important. With the RCT, I'm going to just, uh, sorry, Alex, you're, you're going to hate me for interrupting. I know you're, I'm watching your lips. And if you start opening them, I'm going to defer right to you. So, but uh, Akif, um, you, you showed in the RCT a lot of differences with intubation time. Um, I, I don't know if they met statistical significance. You might've said no, but it seemed like the, the pulsatile group had intubation times that were half the, the length of the, the, the non-pulsatile group. Can you, can you very briefly uh, address that? That's a wonderful observation, Al, really. I mean, this very scientific observation. The reason is because a couple of patients in the non positive group has significantly higher intubation times. Only because of, and because this is a randomized clinical trial, I did not, we do not want to exclude those patients. We, we want to put them all together. So that, that's why, but if I can, you know, at the exclude, exclude only a couple of patients in the non pulsatile group, you know, that the, then it's going to be, but the, because this is randomized clinical trial and we have to go through whatever our, you know, preclinical -clin criteria are. So, you know, that, that that's why we are seeing this uh, basic differences. And also for this clinical trial, we also measure the biomarkers. 
So we are actually currently, we collected the, the blood samples pre, during, and after cardiopulmonary bypass up to 24 hours. So we are currently actually, we are currently looking for at least four or five different biomarkers to co co correlate clinical outcomes with these, as well as we actually change the clinical outcomes uh, in terms of cyanotic versus asynotic patients, that that is going to be another paper we just uh, su submitted for another journal. So we, we will have a lot more in a few months than uh, well, what we have from our clinical uh, trial. Stay tuned. Well, this is wonderful. We're at the top of the hour. Absolutely phenomenal presentation. Great discussion. Um, the one common theme we're seeing in the Q&A uh, Akif, uh, congratulations and thank you for almost everybody. I want to thank all of the individuals who attended tonight's webinar and uh, especially the individuals who wrote in questions or comments. I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. Um, I'd like to uh, also, just to, before we conclude, I want to thank Alex for the wonderful job in co-moderating. Maggie Ring is the, uh, uh, the coordinator of these, but most importantly, uh, Dr. Undar for uh, taking the time out of his busy schedule to, to present this to us. And it's something that we as perfusionists, that we, we, we salivate over. We love getting this information and, and renewing our, our, our energies to pursue further. And we look forward to more work coming out of Penn State Hershey. Uh, congratulations on your bowl game. Um, you know, I think it was a, a great outcome. But, uh, but as I end, I want to thank again everybody. The email addresses are up here. Uh, Dr. Undar has, has said he would answer any emails and he responds extremely quickly. Uh, I give you that from uh, the communications we've had with him. And then Alex and my emails are up here. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out if there's any logistical issues. So with that, um, I want to thank everybody and wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you very much, guys.